Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's conversation at noon. We're really happy to have you with us today virtually. My name is Rebecca Tabor. I am head of public programs. And additionally, I'm the state coordinator for Connecticut History Day. So I'm really excited about today's program. And I'm looking forward to a great conversation with some of our wonderful students and one of our wonderful educators. Today's program really focuses on Connecticut History Day, a year for the history books. And we'll share more about that as we go through. Just as a little introduction, if you're not familiar with Connecticut History Day, um, Connecticut History Day is coordinated by the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut's Old State House. It's one of 58 affiliate programs of National History Day, which we often refer to as NHD. Connecticut History Day promotes the study of history in schools to create a higher degree of appreciation for the values of historical thought in students, educators, and community members. CHD creates college and career ready citizens of the future by engaging students in rigorous inquiry based academic research projects. Connecticut History Day is presented with major funding and partnership support from Connecticut Humanities and support from the Upper Housatonic Valley National Heritage Area and the New Haven Museum. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and visit our website, which is historydayct.org. Each year, approximately 4,000 middle and high school students in Connecticut research a topic related to the National History Day annual theme, which in 2021 was communication in history, the key to understanding. I should just say that that topic was chosen years in advance. So we had no way of knowing that we'd be in the midst of a pandemic when we had that topic. So students may work alone or in groups to research their topic and create a project. Students may write a paper, create a documentary, design a website, make an exhibit, or do a performance. There are three layers of competition in National History Day world. The first are six regional contests that take place here in Connecticut, and students who finish in the top three in one of those contests make it to the state contest. Those students who finish first or second at the state contest qualify for the national contest. This year we had 55 students representing Team Connecticut. And this year at the national contest, and I, I should mention that the national contest was held virtually as were all of our contests, um, 12 Connecticut projects were actually ranked in the top 10 nationally with three projects finishing in the top three, two winning special awards and a further two projects winning the Outstanding Connecticut Awards. Today, I'm really excited that we are joined by a few of these award-winning students. And I'd like to start by introducing the students who are joining us today. We have Claire Flynn from Sedgwick Middle School in West Hartford. Claire won first place in junior individual documentary for her project, Clearing the Air, how John Hershey communicated Hiroshima survivors' stories to the world and changed the global perspective on nuclear weapons. We have Zach Brody from Staples High School in Westport. Zach won third place in senior individual exhibit for his project on blowing smoke, unmasking the persuasive communications techniques of cigarette advertising in the 20th century, a key to understanding the emergence of regulations. And then we have from Worthington, Hooker School in New Haven, June Lanfer, who along with her partner, Maya, um, won the um, Junior Division Outstanding Connecticut Award for their project called the Reindeer Express. They finished fourth place in junior group documentary. And then we have Jeffrey Pogue from Staples High School in Westport, who won the Senior Division uh, Connecticut Outstanding Connecticut Award for his project on Thomas Paine, the most influential man in America, a key to understanding revolutionary communication. And he finished fourth in senior individual performance. We have Inya Raja, who uh, was who placed fifth place for senior individual performance. She's from South Windsor High School. In, and sh she won with her project, Near versus Minnesota, how one man's communication of malicious scandalous and defamatory news was the key to understanding freedom of the press. We have Mansi Han from Worthington Hooker School in New Haven, who won sixth place in junior papers for her project, Objective Journalism, 
versus patriotic narrative, how misinformation was communicated to the American public during the Tet Offensive of 1968. And then we have Clarissa Halprin from Rockville High School, who along with her partner, John Margoloni, were, uh, were placed ninth place for senior group performance for their project on Ted Sorensen, The Letter That Saved the World. So thank you to all of our students for joining us today. We're really happy to see you. And congratulations to all of you for the outstanding uh, results from the national contest. We're really proud and excited for you. I wanna tell members of uh, the audience who are watching to please feel free to post comments. Um, we will see them and we can ask our speakers to answer them um, in the course of our, our program today. I think to um, start with, what I'd like to first maybe start the question with is, as I was introducing all of you, every year I'm struck by the creativeness of our students and National History Day students in choosing topics. I, I feel like I always learn something every year from the work that you do. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you found your topic and what interested you in, in the, the topic that you explored this year? And, oh, and Zach's gonna go first, thank you. Um, so my topic, just to reiterate, was cigarette advertising um, back in like the mid 1900s. And basically I had always been interested in like medical commercials. If you've ever seen a medical commercial, you know they list all of the various side effects and they used to say them really, really quickly. And then over time they got slower. So I wondered, you know, what the legislation was in terms of those commercials. So I looked it up, I did a quick search on Google and I found actually a lot of things about cigarettes and cigarette advertising. And I kind of just went from there. I became really interested in cigarette advertising and you know how all the tactics that they used were so normalized back in the mid 1900s. And my topic just took off from there. Great. Clarissa, did you want to share how you and John found your topic? Because you've been in History Day for several years now, and um, every year you have a really interesting topic that you explore. Uh, yeah, um, we did uh, Ted Sorensen specifically, the letter that he wrote that effectively ended the Cuban Missile Crisis. And originally, I was just looking into like propaganda and how governments communicate with their citizens. And that sort of landed me on Ted Sorensen, who was JFK's speechwriter. And at the same time, John was researching the Cuban Missile Crisis and we had no idea that they really intersected at all. Um, and then I was reading some article and it said something about the letter that he wrote to Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I was like, hey, wait a minute and we just we are really excited because we've been we spent a really long time looking at so many different topics and then suddenly like it would it connected um so yeah yeah sometimes that's the joy of research where things just happen um june you want to talk a little bit about how you found your project sure um so my partner Maya and i both really like animals and we really wanted to do a topic that um, had animals who helped communication in the past. Um, and we were searching out different topics and we found this short dialogue on reindeer carrying the mail in Alaska in the late 1800s. Um, and we had never heard of this topic before and we're really interested in it. Um, and that's how our project, The Reindeer Express, was born. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to look up that one because I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Inya, do you want to go next, maybe? Sure. So my project was the case of Near versus Minnesota, which basically declared prior restraint um, unconstitutional. Basically, um, the topic that I did last year sort of like overlapped with the Pentagon Papers case. So when I heard that the theme this year was communication, I thought that that would be a perfect topic because, you know, it was like a landmark First Amendment case. Um, but then while I was researching that, I saw that they had cited the case of Near versus Minnesota and just looking deeper into that, I became really interested in it because it, well, the story itself is very unique because it starts off with like 
this very small, like racist, like yellow journalist who was living in Minneapolis, which at the time was just like filled with criminals. But somehow like his case just came to like the Supreme Court and had like this huge impact declaring like prior restraint and constitutional, which like helped like um, journalists all over the country and like continues to be very important. Great, thank you. Claire, did you want to share with us how you found your topic? Yeah, I actually came across my topic in a rather coincidental way. Uh, my topic was how uh, John Hersey's Hiroshima impacted the public's view on the atomic weaponry. And I came across this topic when I was sitting in the car listening to NPR. And it was the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima. And during this um, talk about the anniversary, they mentioned John Hersey and his book. And I hadn't heard of Hiroshima, the book before. And so I decided to read it. And after reading, I did research on how John Hersey's book truly impacted America. And because of that, I was able to discover the several different aspects of communication that it helped inspire. Great, thanks. Jeffrey, did you want to share how you found your topic? Yeah, so um, mine sort of, I just kind of stumbled upon it. Um, I was reading about this founding father who wasn't talked about in schools because he attacked religion. And I started reading on and on, and I discovered that the topic was a lot deeper than I'd heard of and I'd seen in the past. And I thought that that would be a great topic, and I kind of fell in love with it pretty quickly. Although one thing that is interesting is looking around, I see a lot of other topics that I'd considered. Um, it just shows how deep it goes. It's pretty cool. Neat. Thank you. And Mansi? Okay, sure. Um, so my topic again is like how objective journalis journalism and uh, patriotic narrative clashed uh, when they were communicating uh, the t offensive to the American public in 1968. So when I was uh, looking for a topic, I didn't have a lot of success. So I was just uh, listening to this book and I sort of came across it. So it was called Dry by Neil Shusterman. And in one of the chapters, there was a character who was a journalist and then she just like remarked that she aspired to be uh, one of like one of the journalists in the TEF actually in the uh, Vietnam War, and then she said that it was like where the best journalism had happened. So when I heard the word journalism, I was like it related to like reporting because like reporting related to communication of information from like the event to the public. So that I was like really in interested because during that time there was. When I was like choosing the topic, there was like a lot of, I guess, clashing between like news sources and a lot of political debate. Uh, like, yeah. So, well, at first I was doing going to do like the uh, Vietnam War journalism, but well, the Vietnam War was like twenty years long, so I knew that I couldn't just put all that in one uh, paper. So, I decided to look at um, different events. In the war so one of them caught my eye it was the Tet offensive it was well i decided to choose that later on because it was very significant and not just uh journalism but also in like the outcome of of the war so as i researched more about it i became more and more interested like how like the government tried to undermine the situation there just to get public support for the war and how like the journalists were almost like heroes of some fictional story who decided to uh tr to actually give the public the real story yeah so that that was how i chose my topic great thank you um and I just wanted to, while uh, Mansi was finishing up, uh, for Mansi and June, Miss Hart, um, your librarian, wanted to give you a shout out and say how proud she is of you. Congratulations to all the students. And Zach, we already had a follow up question. Um, were you surprised or horrified by what you learned about the tobacco industry 
industry's manipulation of the public? Or were you a little bit more cynical, like, yep, that's typical America for you? Um, I mean, when I found it, I was very surprised because going in, going into my project, I knew very little about, you know, cigarette advertisements and the tactics that they used. So one of the reasons I was drawn to cigarette advertising so much was because it just shocked me. You know, all the doctor advertisements and, you know, medical studies and this and that and everything that they had. It just I couldn't believe that that was, you know, legal and allowed. Um, so I I was not cynical at all. I was very surprised. We had a um, thank you for that answer. We had a question from um, Don Rogers, who is not only a, a huge supporter of History Day, but he's also a, a, mem a member of our audience. And he was asking, um, can the students work us through their research process, how they found sources, where and what kind of sources were most valuable? And I should say, I meant to mention this in my introduction, that this was a year like no other, where a lot of the usual places you'd go to research were not open or were limited. So can you speak a little bit about the research that you did and how you found sources where and what kind of sources you most relied on for your projects? Oh, Clarissa. Um, I think that our process was similar to how we normally do it, where, you know, you just start with finding, finding all of the things that you can online, because that can lead you to a lot of like good books and things and primary sources. Um, one thing that was super helpful for us is as we were going through uh, just the general articles that we could find, we came across Ted Sorensen's autobiography, which is, and getting an autobiography is always such a great source because it's the person's life as told by them. Um, and we also found the biography he wrote of JFK, which was also very helpful. And um, other primary sources, because because he was a government employee for one of the most famous presidents of all time during one of the most important time periods in American history, um, there was a lot of a lot of documentation. Um, but because of COVID, uh, the JFK library was closed, and so we were not able to access a bunch of his documents, uh, which was very frustrating because um, that is the kind of information that you really want. Um, and it wasn't even like just random things that he wrote. It was like a lot of his notes on the Cuban Missile Crisis and we just couldn't get them because the JFK library was closed because of COVID. Um, and I think that you just have to work around that and find the information where you can, but there's just like nothing you can do when everything is closed. I know there was another hand up and, oh, Claire, yes. Um, I'd like to echo what Clarissa said. Um, having sources online was obviously enormously helpful because a lot of places in, in person that would have these resources were closed. Um, the sources that I used that were incredibly important were the National Archives, the Yale Beinecke Library Archives also had some super important information and resources related to John Hersey, um, including his personal papers and letters and drafts of Hiroshima. Um, but I think ultimately the most important resource that you can get is interviews with people who were there or related to the incident. I was able to interview a Hiroshima survivor and someone who worked with disarmament issues in the present, um, who's actually inspired to work in disarmament because of Hiroshima. Great. And yeah, I know you had your hand up as well. Uh, yeah, so I would definitely agree. Like everyone else, my research definitely started online. Um, the one thing that I will say is, um, obviously there was a lot of issues with everything being closed, but I think um, it also sort of opened up like new opportunities because normally I like go in person to archives and like I look for places that are near me, but because I obviously wasn't able to do that with the pandemic, I actually like looked further like across the country to places I normally wouldn't go to. 
Um, so like I contacted the Minnesota Historical Society and the Northwestern University Archives. Um, and there were people there who were very helpful. They were able to like send photocopies of documents that they thought would be helpful. Um, and then um, I would agree with Claire, um, interviews were also very helpful. Unfortunately, I couldn't really meet with anybody or anything. So I did do like email interviews, but um, yeah, that was really helpful. My interviews, because my topic happened in the 1930s, it was a little hard to find anybody that was like still alive that I could interview, but I was able to um, find um, a granddaughter of somebody who was alive and who was a journalist that was um, murdered for what he was saying against like um, politicians and criminals in the same area as um, Jane Eyre, who's part of my topic. And then also uh, another journalist who exposed like uh, the FBI's counterintelligence program. And he was able to explain, you know, like the significance of how like declaring prior restraint unconstitutional allowed him to say what he did. Great, thank you. Did anyone else want to share with their Jeffrey? Yeah, so I just wanted to echo especially um, about interviews. One thing that surprised me is how like sort of eager many people are to talk about subjects that they're very interested in. A lot of my information came like, I couldn't get anyone who knew Thomas Paine personally since he lived 500 years ago, 300 years ago. So I got, experts at colleges and they were all so helpful and so willing to talk and work me through my thinking process and generally i'm taking that out of out of the nhd process into real life to if i ever need anything a lot of these experts are super willing to help if you just ask to join us zach um, I think Jeffrey made a great point there, and I kind of want to echo a little bit with, of what he said. Um, I think one of the things that really helped me with the interviews, I had, I had two different interviews, and one of them I had with the Connecticut Department of Health, someone who worked on like jewel regulations, and the other I had with someone who worked um, in the cigarette industry. And the different perspectives that those interviews can give you are something that it's just so much different than reading a source, because one of the things that I've I learned through Connecticut History Day was perspective is so important when you're doing research. And a lot of, you know, the research that I found was very heavy anti-cigarette. Um, and so to talk to someone from the cigarette industry and see the way he, you know, see his perspective on these issues really helped me to kind of gain my own perspective. Great, thank you. June. And June, while you're talking, we did have a request from an audience member um, who said, can you give us a, I, I know you talked about reindeer being used to deliver mail in Alaska, but can you give us a little bit more of a brief synopsis about your topic, since that's one that's maybe a little bit more unusual? Yeah, so um, our topic was about reindeer who carried mail in the late 1800s. Um, and it started off with this man named Sheldon Jackson, who was a US missionary. Um, and he came to Alaska um, and he wanted to change some of the native Alaskan culture. Um, and also he wanted to help out the Inuits um, after the great death that happened after the known gold rush. And so he decided that um, to help them and also to change their culture, he would turn them into a herding tribe um, instead of hunters and gatherers. And um, he wanted to do this because in the time period, many people herded cattle and sheep in the U.S. And so he decided to import reindeer from Siberia and Scandinavia. Um, and along with the reindeer came the Sami, who were um, a reindeer herding tribe in northern Scandinavia. And so the reindeer and the Sami all came over to Alaska to help the Inuits learn how to herd these reindeer. And together, um, they herded reindeer for a few years. And then at a few years later, um, communication started to get really tough in Alaska and delivering the mail. Um, because at the time, dog sleds were used to carry the mail. And dog sleds were starting to um, not really work because dogs needed to be fed food. They couldn't run very long. 
Um, and so Sheldon Jackson decided that reindeer would carry the mail in Alaska. And um, reindeer carried the mail for a long, long time, and it was a great source of communication and a great way to deliver the mail. Um, but like a few years later, things started to go downhill. Like for example, the weather in Alaska is really, really cold and frigid. Um, so it was really, really hard for drivers and reindeer to get across the Alaskan tundra, and one man even froze to death. Um, and so the program started to go downhill after a few years, but it definitely improved communication in Alaska and um, inspired for other ways in, to communicate. Um, and I was just going to talk a little bit about um, how we conducted our research quickly. Um, because our topic wasn't really well known. There was only, I think, one source that talked just about our project. Um, and so we had to piece together different articles and everything about Sheldon Jackson and Native Alaskans and the Sami. Um, but we were really fortunate to find um, one source that was Sheldon Jackson's personal notebook, and he was writing about the reindeer that carried the mail. And that was really, really helpful in our research. Where did you find that? Um, we found it. I can check later. I can't exactly remember the exact source <laughs> right now, but um, this it was just this um, website that showed um, primary sources. And we looked up Sheldon Jackson, and his personal notebooks and writings came up on the screen. So that was really, really helpful. Great. I should just mention as we're chatting that um, if you would like to see everyone's project from today, you can check out the History Day website, which is www.historydayct.org slash national um, and then hyphen contest. And you can actually see everyone's project from who's, who's joining us today. We're fortunate that um, we have almost every category except for websites represented today. So um, if you um, could just speak briefly to the category you chose and why you were drawn to that category. Mansi? Okay, so um, the category that I chose was paper. So this, I chose it last year because I've done uh, a history day two, for two years now. So um, last year there were, there were basically very unexperienced, but I didn't really know what category to do because I I just didn't have a lot of experience. So at first I was going to do a website, but well, because a lot of people were doing that in my class. But then um, when we were like researching, we had to, for school, we had to write a research paper, mandatory. So I was basically writing that paper and I just felt like it was like a very comfortable way for me to share my opinions and share the facts that I researched. And one of my teachers, like, he took it far further. He said he was, like, grading my paper, and he was like, you're really natural at this. Like, you should try writing a paper. So that first year, I didn't really get very far in the contest. But it was still, I just felt like it was natural, like, just using words, nothing else to communicate my ideas. So I didn't really use any photos or art. But I just felt like it was like in me to write papers. So that was why I just why I did. So I'm Great. still writing papers now. Great. Thank you. Zach. Um, oh, I chose the exhibit um, topic. And I think one of the main reasons I chose it was because it went really well with my topic. Obviously, I wanted to show a lot of the cigarette advertisements, and I think that some of the images were really powerful, and that helped to kind of, you know, make my topic and my presentation stand out even more. And I also, I thought that it was kind of a nice change up from, you know, the normal school life of just writing paper after paper. I thought that the creative exhibit, along with, you know, the the research and the words that you had to write was kind of a nice combination. So not only was I, you know, doing a lot of research and school type work, but I also, you know, was creating the exhibit board and doing the design element, which I, you know, really enjoyed. And then I know um, Inya and Jeffrey 
both did performances and they had their hands raised to say why they chose that category. Okay, so I've been doing History Day for five years and every year I've done a performance. So I do think that it is something that I'm more comfortable with doing. But um, the reason that I continue it and even started to do it is because I think a performance is a really cool way to like bring your topic to life. Um, and it just overall like a really cool way to connect with what you're doing because as like I act as like the various characters, I can really see like the new perspective of my topic and maybe what they were thinking while they were in that certain situation and like the different um, things that were going on around them and how that affected their different decisions. Um, I just think it's like a really cool topic and you, you can be really creative with what you do and how you present your information, so. Jeffrey. Yeah, adding on to that, I think it really forces you to be completely familiar and comfortable in your topic because you only have these 10 minutes to share all of the information and you can't just say it. You have to introduce it through the characters. You need to bring in the anecdotes. You need to add in the feeling. You need to have these pauses for dramatic effect and et cetera. And it makes you, so for, for example, in mine, I felt that for every single line, I said and that I had in my script, there were another five that I had to cut out. So it really makes you understand your topic, understand the core of your topic and know what is important, what isn't. Um, so that's what I really liked about it, as well as it made me like think of a creative way to present my information, which I think I ended up with. So I thought it was, I think it's a very cool and unique uh, form of presentation. And Clarissa, we'll, we'll hear from our other performer. Um, I've also been doing this for five years, John, and I uh, started doing it in sixth grade. Um, and in sixth grade, we started doing a performance because um, we were both, we both liked to act, we both wanted to be in, in the drama club at our school. And so like, we were just like, hey, we could write a little play, that would be so fun. Um, and over the years, it's been both the most challenging and the most interesting thing uh, to do uh, because you have to figure out how you are going to present your information. Um, you know, what characters are you going to play? And um, like Jeffrey said, like, you have to know what you need to say and there is a limit to what you can say and one of the hardest parts is cutting out lines because you're like well i need this information but i don't have time for it and <laughs> and i just it's it's just always so fun to create the performance because you're doing all this research and then you get to show that you're like actually doing something you've you've really learned it you know what you're talking about and I just think that it's just such an interesting way to show it. Great, thank you. And June, I know you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I did the documentary category. And I think documentaries are a really great category because there's so many ways you can be creative with it. And you're able to capture your um, viewer through photos and videos and audio recordings and even your own voice. And it's just really great to see your whole video come together at the end, like a little movie. Um, and I think it's just a really rewarding category. Great, thank you. Well, at this time, I'd like to um, pause for a second and invite another guest to join us. We wanted to have the student perspective, of course, but we also wanted to have the teacher perspective as well. And I'd love to introduce Jennifer McMunn. Uh, Jennifer is a teacher at Mansfield Middle School and guides students through the History Day experience. She's been a teacher for 19 years eight years at Mansfield Middle School. And each year since she's uh, been involved with History Day, she's had at least one student finish first at the state contest. This past year, she had 14 students qualify for the national contest. Um, congratulations on that one. Um, and she's very involved with History Day, not only as a teacher, she served for several years as our Mansfield uh, regional coordinator and has also judged at both Connecticut contests and at the national contest. So we're happy to have her with us um, today um, briefly. And um, 
Jennifer, can you talk a little bit about why you're so committed to History Day and why you think it's important for students to have this experience? Sure. Um, first off, I mean, I'm, I'm committed to it because students love it. It's something that once a student tries it, they typically do it again. I mean, not always, but most kids I have that start the program go on to do it another year. Um, it's a huge bonding experience, not only student to student, but teacher to student. I feel like I really get to know my History Day kids well. And I hear from fellow teachers and the students who participate how much it just helps them academically. Um, I've, I had a science teacher say to me once that she can immediately tell when it comes to lab, lab report writing, um, which kids in class have done history day before because their their inquiry skills and their writing and their motivation are just so strong from the program. Um, so it's something that I, I just see kids come alive and I, I see them enjoy the process and, and I always support it. And it's something that even when my students go into high school, I continue to sponsor them and continue to work with them because I think if, if anyone's asking to do this extra project, and to participate in this contest, I'm going to make them, I'm gonna help them do it. It's it's huge. Great, thank you. Well, um, I'd like to kind of throw this question out to everyone, um, both students and teachers. And, you know, after having been through the National History Day process, what skills do you feel like you've learned from being a History Day participant? Oh, everyone, oh, excellent. Um, why don't we start with Clarissa? Um, I think that besides just like the academic researching and writing skills that you learn, um, you also gain the ability to understand perspectives and how that plays a part in uh, just everything that happens in the world. Like you're able to fully understand what's happening and why people are responding to it the way that they do. And I think that it allows you to have a more informed opinion about things that happen in the world, both like historically and presently. And I just think that that makes you a better citizen because you're able to understand and therefore take action that is going to benefit the most, at least, at least the most amount of people, if not everybody, because you're able to understand what the problem is and why people are upset. Um, and I just think that that helps you in every single aspect of your life. Um, so, Great. And Clarissa, I think also um, you and John are great examples of teamwork because you've worked together as a team for so many years, and that's not always an easy thing to do. And you've been a really successful duo. Yeah, I think it helps you learn to compromise. <laughs> because you wanna do it one way and they wanna do it the other way and you have to figure out how to make it work so that both of you are happy with the final product. Great, thank you. I know we had some other hands up. Claire. Um. I mean, I agree with all of those things and more, but I think one of the most important things you learn from History Day is the ability to take feedback and make improvements. My project is an entirely different project than what I submitted at the regional level. The History Day judges give amazing feedback and it was able to change my project entirely for the better. Great. Nancy? Yeah, so one skill that I really, I think is really important that I took away from um, doing an NHG project would be just finding and analyzing primary sources because I feel like, like in textbooks and history books, they often just give you the main opinion or whatever the author thinks about the primary sources. So when I was doing my project, I, I was uh, finding a lot of news articles. So I was actually like analyzing them from my own like perspective because I feel like just a lot of people have, a lot of um, historians actually, I feel like have, they have like a lot of 
our knowledge and there's some sometimes they like lean on one side and I just wanted to like take a unbiased side and just like be like naive almost when I um we analyze my uh, my uh, sources so that's also a good because like in the world you can't like just believe everything that everyone else says because you have to look at the event and decide for yourself. Zach, I think, did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, there were a few things that I thought Mystery Day really helped me to develop. Um, one of them was kind of being able to focus my research, especially with my topic, there was just so much information available. Um, and so, you know, using the, the theme for the year and, and, you know, using like an outline, you just have to learn how to take all of the information that you have and kind of focus in on what you want to research because, you know, there's not enough time to research everything that exists. Um, and that kind of brings me right to my next point, which is consolidating. And I know Jeffrey and I think Clarissa touched on that earlier, but I think with every, you know, whatever type of project you do, you're going to have to consolidate your work. Um, and it comes back to the same idea. There's so much information that you research. There's so much information that you learn and you only have, you know, a certain amount of space or a certain amount of time to get that information across. So learning how to take what you have and cut it down just to include the best information is something that, you know, History Day really helped me to do. And Inya, I know you had your hand up as well. Um, so I was going to say that I learned a lot about like sort of presenting information and organizing everything that I learned. And I think this sort of connects back to um, everybody's response. It's just like you learn how to really like um, you have a lot to say, but you have a limited time to say it. And you need to have like a well-rounded presentation where it's like interesting, but also like informative. And so I think I learned a lot about like sort of how to play around with different formats and focus on different things to really get my point across, but also keep the present presentation like interesting and engaging to the audience. Great. And Mrs. Mrs. McMahon, you kind of alluded to this earlier when you were talking about um, uh, other teachers noticing which students had done a History Day project, can, and you have the benefit of working sometimes with students over a number of years. Can you talk to some of the skills that you see students develop through their History Day experience? So beyond any academic skill, I think really grit and resiliency um, are character traits that history fosters and helps develop. History Day is challenging. When you first start it, you really can't envision the end because many times you're participating never having been to a contest before and certainly never having been through the entire process. Um, it can be beneficial if you've had a sibling participate, of course. Um, but being able, especially for those students who are, are strong and have been strong students all their academic careers and are used to just hearing praise from teachers, I mean, Claire spoke to this, being able to take critical feedback and to really think about using that to improve your work, but learning some new skills. So making an, an annotated bibliography that honestly, um, I didn't do something to that scope and magnitude until I was in college to do that in sixth or seventh grade in some cases. Is, is can be really challenging. So I think that History Day does does foster grit. Um, and as others have spoke to economy of language. So oftentimes I think students hear that elaborating on the writing is, is beneficial. Um, so many students believe that writing more is kind of the way to get your point across. And History Day teaches that very real, especially in our electronic age, skill of paring back on what you're saying picking the most important words and ideas and really presenting those to your audience. And, and I think that's hugely beneficial for writers. And I think, Jeffrey, you had your hand up. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to not call on you. No, it's all right. Yeah, I just wanted, to, I'm just reiterating what other people have said at this point, but the ability to like read a text and understand like the key ideas and then understand how to do uh, speak those key ideas yourself out. Um, I, I've just like never had that much practice and needed to do it to such intensity as I did when I was like, for example, needing to cut out a three quarters of my script. Um, 
And I think that's something that I'll definitely be able to take with me anytime I need to write or anytime I'm in any crunch ever. It's very helpful. Great, thank you. Well, um, Cindy McManaman, who it works with students at Vernon um, Center School and along with her, her graduates who've gone on like Clarissa and John, um, and she also works with us here in the national, uh, excuse me, the state office, but she first of all wanted to say congratulations to all of you. Um, what advice would you give to a student participating in History Day for the first time? And yeah. Um, you know, I would just say, like, really try to enjoy, like, the whole process. I know, especially the first year that I was participating, I was definitely, like, more stressed out about everything. And I was like, oh, my God, I need to learn how to do this and this and this. But um, I think it's also really important just to, you know, enjoy what you're learning and seeing how your project comes to life and being able to, you know, appreciate everything that um, all the hard work that you've done and everything like that. Claire. I think my main advice for History Day is, um, is twofold. Number one, you should make it fun. I think a lot of students are hesitant to do History Day because they think it's going to be like a school project where you're going to do a project that's part of the curriculum. And it's something that you should do. But the thing about History Day is that you can make it your own, and something that you want to do. And then my second piece of advice is to not be scared about it. Um, with interviewing people and writing something or performing or editing something that will be shown that a bunch of people may seem scary, but the results will be so amazing and it'll pay off. Zach. Oh, how about we go with Mrs. McMunn? Cause I know. Um, I was just gonna say, love your topic. It's going to be pick something that you want to learn about. And I always advise students something that they think will um, bring some benefit to the modern world maybe a story that needs to be told or something that connects with a belief or a passion. Just you're going to spend a lot of time with this particular topic, reading about it and learning about it. So make sure that it's something that you love. And we'll go to Zach now. Um, I think everyone's made really great points and I you know, echo all of those. One of the things that I would add was is time management. Um, History day, you know, you it's, what I found is it's really important to manage your time and balance out things. It's not something where you can just grind it at the last minute and um, you know get it done. Uh, you really have to plan and figure out what you're going to do when and kind of you know maybe make a schedule so that you stay you know on top of it and on time and that's kind of the best way to you know go about having a solid project. Jeff? Yeah, I really agree with that. Um, one thing to me at least is I feel like I didn't start until much later than I needed to just because it felt like so much you have to create this entire project from nothing. So I think knowing what you're going to do, plan ahead, make sure you know what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, and it really helps you work your way through it. And I think Clarissa, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, um, something that I would say is very helpful is learning about History Day and like the process, like look at projects that people have done in the past um, and read through the like the rule book and the guides and like learn about what you need to be doing and things like that and like what the process is because I think that in sixth grade, one, something that would have been really, really helpful is if we actually had a clear understanding of what we were trying to achieve rather than just like a general idea of what we thought it was going to be. Um, because I think that can really help you understand where you need to go in order to create the project and time manage like, like everyone else was saying. 
And just a little infomercial, you can find uh, project examples both on the National History Day website and the Connecticut History Day website as well. Mansi, did you want to add anything about advice you'd give to a first time History Day student? Yeah, so I just wanted to say that I totally agree with everyone who said, talked about how like the research portion and like making the project. And I wanted to just, just add that um, History Day for like someone who just uh, started doing it, that it's okay if you don't get into like the top three, like your first try, because last year I definitely didn't. So this is like, it, it helps you like be resilient because you can try again next year and you can just build on your experience with History Day. So until you like, one day you might actually get like national, like in the finalists or in the top three. So don't be like afraid to like fail almost because <laughs> you can try again. So yeah. That's great advice from everyone. Um, I know a couple of you alluded to judging and getting good feedback. Um, this year we had a new, um, rubric that we used. If anyone wants to talk about their judging experiences from um, regionals to states to nationals. Claire? Yeah, I think having this new rubric was definitely a good thing. Um, I think the judging this year was absolutely phenomenal. I think that the feedback I got from the judges um, the question said, did it vary? Um, not really. I think it was pretty consistent in that it they told me what I needed to do for the next step of the way. And Great. I used it to improve. Great. June, I think I saw your hand up as well. Yeah, well, I agree with Claire. Um, I think the judges were really good this year and they gave really good feedback. Um, and I think that um, like what Mansu was saying, um, like it's it's nice to know what um, you like need to work on and need to improve so you can try again next year or try again for the next competition too. Great, thank you. Well, we're getting to the end of our time. To oh, Clarissa, did you have your hand up? Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, I was sorry. just going to say that um, our experience with the judges this year was not as good as other people's it appears and I um I don't know it was a little frustrating uh just because one thing is one of the best parts of doing it is being able to talk to the judges in person and because we weren't able to do that I think that um something was a little lost but um it was also just kind of frustrating because we did not receive awesome feedback all the way through and we we didn't we weren't sure what we sh what we should improve and what worked and what didn't work because nothing was specific enough for us this year. I don't know. I think that the nationals judges really gave us feedback on what we should improve, but I'm not sure that that was true for regionals or states. But normally, normally it's good. But this year, I think it was just a little off. I don't know. But I think Clarissa performances had the hardest sometimes without having people there in person. Um, and you bring up a really good point, which is um, good feedback has constructive criticism. And I think everyone's kind of touched on that. And, um, you know, I, I look, think back to when I was younger, and I think that's really a great skill that all of you have learned to it, that, Clarissa, you welcome that. You want some constructive criticism, not just all positive stuff, because it helps you grow and learn. And I think that's an amazing skill to have as a young person so so early in, in your lives. Um, unfortunately, we, we are kind of coming to the end of our time together. And I want to thank everyone for their wonderful comments. And maybe as a kind of closing statement, um, I would just ask everyone to say, what was your History Day highlight of the year? We'll start off with Zach. Um, I I would say I kind of had two. The first, um, after the state competition, I got an interview. I think I touched on it briefly earlier. I got an interview with someone um, who worked, you know, in finance for one of the cigarette companies, and it was just such an interesting experience to have that interview and to talk to this, you know, professional after all the research that I had done. It was just it it honestly it was a lot of fun. 
Um, and I know, I know people have talked about you have to make History Day fun, and that was one of the most fun and exciting parts of History Day for me was talking to this guy and bringing everything that I had to the table, you know, seeing how he critiqued it and what he had to say about it. I thought it was a really interesting experience, and it was something that I'll really always remember. Claire? Um, I'd like to agree. Having an interview was definitely one of the most impactful experiences of History Day. Um, I, you know, I told you earlier, I interviewed a Hiroshima survivor and hearing her talk about her experiences when she was the same age as I was interviewing her, um, just living through some absolutely terrible things and then coming to America and seeing everyone's reactions to the bombing was immensely powerful. June? Um, I think my favorite part about history of the day this year is one, working with my partner, um, but two, like seeing our project come together. Um, and when we watched it, when it was completely done, we saw all our hard work, um, in the project, it was really, really, um, it was really, really nice to see. Great. Jeffrey? One, the big highlight for me was like, I think it probably the, the day or so before nationals when a lot of my friends and I were all competing and we were all getting together and seeing who is going to get in, who wasn't, or just not, not even like to that extent, just like the buzz about this project that we've been working on and how well it's going to do. It was, it was very cool for me, at least. Clarissa? Um, I think that finally figuring out our topic was just the most exciting part this year because at least I was getting incredibly frustrated because we had been spending so much time just looking at stuff and we couldn't find anything that we really liked. And then suddenly, like, the two things that we were looking at just had a common factor. And I was just so excited because I was like, yes, you know, we can do something. And I was just, I was just really excited to really get going on the project. And that was just very exciting. Nancy? Yeah, so my highlight of um, History Day would be probably when I was starting my project because I had like a lot of information and a lot of research that I did and it was just like really fun to just like spell everything out on a Google Doc and I like then I didn't have to worry about the word count or anything I just like but whatever I thought would be uh, helpful to uh, my argument I just it was really fun to just do that. Great. So I think we've, Inya, we'll give you the final word. Um, I was going to say the same thing as June, just like seeing my project come together, especially like this year, just because so many things were different, you know, especially like research wise and even like meeting with teachers to get like feedback or just answer any questions that I had. So it was just really satisfying to know that I was able to, you know, um, adapt and be able to um, really complete a project that I was satisfied with. Great, well, thank you so much to all of our guests today. It's been great speaking with the students and speaking with Mrs. McMahon who had to uh, uh, leave a little bit early. Um, congratulations to all of our Connecticut students who participated in the national contest, all who participated in this past year. Um, I think Clarissa touched on it a little bit, which is um, we're glad we were able to have a successful year with virtual contests, but we sure miss seeing all of you. And we're very hopeful that we'll be back in person next year. Um, this coming year, um, we're looking forward to uh, a National History Day theme on debate and diplomacy in history, successes, failures, consequences. So I can't wait to see what topics everyone comes up with. I want to thank all of our students for joining us today. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us with uh, great comments and um, uh, uh, great, great questions for our speakers.
for those of you who are with us today, um, we're going to take a little break in August with our conversations at noon and resume them in uh, September. Um, meanwhile, you can come in person and see us here at Connecticut's Old State House on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, we have the farmer's market, which is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then most Fridays, including this Friday, um, we have a performance by Goodnight Blue Moon at noon. So we invite you to bring um, a blanket or a chair and bring your lunch and come enjoy uh, music. We also just reopened for tours here at Connecticut's Old State House. We're taking play part rather in the um, summer museum program in which um, you can bring a, a, a child under 17 and a accompanying adult will get in free for Connecticut residents. So we hope you'll come and, and do a tour with us. And um, we really appreciate all of you being with us today. We hope to see you very soon. And thank you all. And congratulations again to all of the Connecticut students. We're really proud of you. And thanks for sharing your time and your expertise with us today.